<laughs> Hello, welcome, BL. Welcome to Stevens Elementary School here in Burlington, Kentucky. Where are you? I'm in New York City. And I think you've connected us with somebody halfway around the world. So glad you could join us from Spain today. Uh, we've been very, very interested in what you have to share with us today. Uh, this whole idea of 3D printing. You know what? I was introduced to 3D printing by watching Grey's Anatomy. You know, on Grey's Anatomy, they build these organs for people, which I'm curious to find out if that actually happens. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what's going on in your, your side of the world with your invention, what it is, and where it came from. Houdini is the world's first 3D food printer that actually prints sweet and savory types of food. And it does it using all fresh ingredients, which is a big difference from other types of printers. So I know you guys did a lot of research, so I don't want to necessarily repeat all that research that you guys have done. I don't know if you want to dive straight into the types of questions that you have. Well, um, we do want to know uh, what you can cook. <laughs> so. OK, I'll tell you what. I'll give you some samples of what we cook, and we actually made a few special samples for you guys today. Now, I made these extra big so you can try to see them on a webcam. Does anybody know what that is? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's a Love gigantic it. cookie with the Steelers. <laughs> so we downloaded a logo, printed the cookie out, and so the cookie, we made our own cookie dough. And we put it into food capsules that went inside of Foodini. We pulled the logo from the internet, and it basically printed the logo. So the best way to think about 3D printing is like a normal printer when you print out your homework or something else on a sheet of paper. Now when that happens, your printer prints ink on a sheet of paper. Now imagine that sheet of paper got stuck, and you kept printing the same word over and over and over again with ink so that you would get a word that kept growing on the paper and getting higher and higher. That's what 3D printing is in basic terminology. So instead of printer ink, we actually use food. And it's all types of different food, both sweet and savory food. So we can make meals like a hamburger, or we can make a dessert such as the cookie. Okay, hey, go ahead. Ask your question. Hi, my name is Cassie Rantel. Oftentimes in STEM class, our first build trial fails. Did you experience this? What problems did you encounter, and how did you solve them? Well, I'll tell you, with 3D food printing, we do a lot of errors. So do you know how sometimes when you see food that's not quite right, it didn't turn out right? We get mistakes, too. So I don't. in your research, you may have seen that we printed 3D dinosaurs. Did you see those? Yeah. No. No. The first time we printed that, it did not look like that. The first time we printed it is our green spinach was too watery. And when we baked it, it went all over the tray and created a big green blob and did not look like a dinosaur at all. So we had to figure the spinach and make it a bit thicker so that when we cooked it, it wouldn't spread all over the place. So yeah, things do go wrong, but then it lets you have to play around with it a little bit, like you would with any other food. And so it's really a matter of trial and experimentation, and you keep trying until you get it right. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. What is your version of the food you need in five to ten years? Do you picture it in the home of an av of every average person? Do you think it could end world hunger? Actually, in five to ten years, we think that most kitchens will have a 3D food printer. So do you have a microwave in your house now? Do you have a microwave? Yes. I think yes. a lot of your friends have a microwave, too. But when they first came out in the 70s for kitchens, not a lot of people had them. So we think it's going to be the same with 3D food printers and that every one of you will have a 3D food printer in your kitchen in about five to ten years. And as for world hunger, depending on what you can do with the food, if you can put food in capsules and you can keep it fresh without using a lot of preservatives, 
that could help get food to different parts of the world that need it so that they can make different types of dishes that may not be available locally. So our focus as a company isn't necessarily ending world hunger. That's a big mission to do, but we hope we can help contribute to that by allowing different types of food in different countries. Good question. Very Who's good. next? Raise your hand. Go ahead. How do you see... Hi, my name is Taylor. Hi. How do you see the food changing our world? Is there older technology you eventually see it placing, replacing? Well, we see 3D food printers will enable more people to cook fresher foods at home. So think about when you go to a supermarket. There's a lot of food that you probably buy that's already in packages, like crackers or breadsticks, right? Or other types of things like this. So rather than buying them in a package, what if you made them at home with a 3D food printer? So you can make the same thing. You can replicate it in your house, but you would know exactly the ingredients you put in it. And if you wanted it to be a bit more fun, you can even print different shapes that you would like. Okay, just make okay go ahead, tell us your name. Hi, my name is James Hoffman and my question is, what in your life has changed the most since you invented the Foodini? I think the thing that's changed the most is I have no more time to do anything else. <laughs> so, when you, when you start a company and you're really passionate about it, which means you really love it, it seems like the hours at work go by very quickly and you don't have enough hours in the day to do everything. So I find that since I started working with Houdini and started this company, there's so many things to do and it's so much fun that the days go by very quickly that I really don't find that there's a lot of time to do too much other things. So that's probably the thing that's changed the most is that I don't have enough time to do everything. <laughs> How did, how did you become interested in science and engineering? And well, where do the arts fit into your line of work? Well, after I got my master's degree in marketing, um, I started working in the technology sector, actually, in New York City. So, And while I was getting my MBA and my undergraduate degree in college, I worked in computer labs, and I took a handful of computer coding classes, although I'm not a coder, so I didn't get that far with it. But I really got interested in technology and electronics and what have you after I got my master's degree, and I started working in companies that specialized in those products, including Microsoft. So those are the types of companies I worked in. As for the arts, I also took a lot of arts classes in school and in college. And I think arts is very important in conjunction with technology. As an example with Houdini, we created a technical device that does 3D food printing, but it's a kitchen appliance. So it needs to look really good in somebody's kitchen. So somebody needs to design that to make sure it looks very good in somebody's kitchen and they would be proud to have that appliance in their kitchen. But at the same point, the arts also has to work with technology. Because if you design something that looks good, but doesn't work with the technology or doesn't work with the manufacturing line, the product doesn't get done. So I think with arts and technology, they both have to work together hand in hand to make sure you can actually build something that looks really great. Um, my name is David. Um, if I had an idea for an invention, what are the first steps I would take? and um, how long did it take you to make the Foodini? Well, we're still making Foodini, and we've been working on it for about two years now. So it's been quite some time. It takes a long time to get hardware and software to work together and to make sure it's something that people want. And as for your ideas, if you have an idea for an invention, I would recommend that you talk to some people about it so you can get some feedback and some of their ideas to see if it's a good idea. And if you really love your idea and you think you want to take it to the next level, I don't know how much you guys do in school about business plans or if you get used to, you know, if you make something, how would you sell it? How would you make it? Who would want to buy it? I would start answering those types of questions 
And if you're still excited about your idea after you start thinking about those ideas, then I think you should have a really great idea and you should continue with it. But if you get bored with the answers, or you don't want to look through the answers, or you're not too excited about it anymore after asking all those other questions about who wants to buy it and how you would build it, then you probably don't have much passion for that idea. And then if you don't have passion or if you don't love the idea you have, it's very hard to do it. So I would recommend that whatever idea you have, you make sure you love it and you can keep moving it forward. What is your favorite dish that Foodini makes? Ah, that's a good question because you make so many different things. My answer changes. If you ask me this tomorrow, I might change my answer. Hi, my name is Justin Moore, and I would like to ask you how old were you when you came up with the, came up with the idea to make the Foodini? How old I was? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll give you a range. <laughs> so. I had already gotten my college degree and my undergraduate degree, so I'm much older than you right now because I also had a few jobs in between getting those degrees and getting jobs and then coming to Fudini. So let's see, how old are you now? You're 10. I'm probably the same age as your parents or four times as your age. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'll give you a little math problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um. Hi, my name is Emily Sisson. How did making the Fugini, making the Fujini help with business skills for later on? That's a really good question. So, with making the Fujini, it's not just making the product. It's actually thinking about how much it's going to cost to make it. How much it's going to you want to sell it to people? How you're going to market it to tell people about it? who wants to buy it, and just loads of other questions. So you really have to think of not only making the actual product, but who's going to buy it and at what price point. And then you have to think through distribution and how you're going to build it. So basically what I'm doing now is I'm writing a lot of business plans, which are very lengthy documents, answering all these questions and thinking through all these questions. So it's really helped from a business standpoint to make sure you're thinking about everything around the product to make sure it's something that's worth selling and something worth building. My name is DJ, and I wanted to ask, how long did it take to make the Fudini? Is there anything the Fudini can't make? Actually, yes. There's quite a few things the Fudini cannot make. <laughs> So to just wrap up our interview with you, Linda, I do have one question too. Yeah. So obviously your company is not just working on Fudini. I'm sure you've got people thinking about what the next big item is going to be. Can you give us some hints? What can we expect from your company in the next couple of years? Okay, yes, I'll give you some hints. So right now with Fudini... Without, without getting fired. Without getting okay. fired. <laughs> so right now with Fudini, this is more of the introduction model, if you will. So that means it does not cook. So some food you can eat straight out of Fudini, such as chocolate or mashed potatoes. But some other foods, such as this hamburger and the cookie, you would have to cook it in an oven after you printed it. However, the next version we're looking at actually does the cooking for you in the same device. So perhaps one day these 3D food printers can actually replace your microwave or replace your oven because it will have the same functionality built in, plus it could actually 3D print your food for you as well. That's amazing. <laughs> I also wanted, before we hang up with Lynette, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about what you're doing, because I don't think we made that clear. I heard at the beginning of the broadcast, someone called you the Google lady, and you're not the Google lady at all. You're B.L. Bachman. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, well, I run a company called Maximum Plus, and what we do is we train educators and uh, associations and brands how to use all these magical tools that Google Plus provides and then we produce events like these and we've had the pleasure of doing this with you and this is just a joy you guys have been fantastic today and I want to hey boys and girls why don't you show your appreciation by doing you know the silent wave thing the silent clapping can you do that to Lynette and to BL, thank them.
Thank you, so <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you for all the great questions. Okay, everybody, Fantastic. this is going to be on YouTube later today. And um, what I'm going to do later for all of you is I'm going to make timestamps on the video so that you'll be able to go directly to specific questions that you're particularly interested in. That might take me the rest of the day, but it's going to get done. So thank you so much, Lynette, and thank you to everybody at Stevens Elementary School. You guys rock.